This evening, we are truly lucky to have such a renowned economist and philosopher speaking at our college. A man of such accolades needs no introduction, but I will try. Dr. Block began his education at James Madison High School in Brooklyn, where he was, ironically, on the same track team as Bernie Sanders. He went on to receive his PhD in economics from Columbia University and made the ideological journey to anarcho-capitalism through a mix of Ayn Rand, Henry Hazlitt, and Murray Rothbard. He has written over 500 peer-reviewed scholarly articles and many books, including Defending the Undefendable, The Privatization of Roads and Highways, and Legalized Blackmail. He currently holds the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair at the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University, New Orleans, and is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. It is my honor to introduce, to speak on topics from his book, Defending the Undefendable, Dr. Walter Block. I'm here to speak about libertarianism, and I want to start off by how I became a libertarian in the first place. Yes, Bernie Sanders and I were buddies. He was uh, one of the best runners in New York City at the time. I was a mediocre runner, so I was behind him all the time. Um, we lived in the same quadrant away from Madison High School, so sometimes we'd walk to school together or walk from school. I wasn't bosom buddies with him, but we were friendly friends, so we'd go on track meets together. And my views were roughly the same as his. Millionaires and billionaires are bad. Capitalism is no good. Well, by the way, in the introduction, uh, somebody asked, uh, suggested that you be respectful to me. I'm highly indignant and insulted. I, I wanted a, a riot, you know, <laughs> uh, like they do in Berkeley, but everyone's so nice here. That just shows I'm a failure. I, if I were more successful, people would be rioting. So uh, I, I, I told Kim, next time I'm invited here, I'm going to orchestrate a, a rebellion against me <laughs> so, so I can make the big time. So anyway, I was a pinko, commie, socialist, weirdo, whatever, and Ayn Rand came to Brooklyn College to lecture. And I came to boo and hiss her because if you had free enterprise, we all knew that uh, the economy would fall apart, we'd have starvation and, and mass, uh, uh, mass chaos, and, and we just need central planning, we need communism. And uh, at the end of the lecture, they announced that the Ayn Rand Study Club that had invited her to speak was having a luncheon in her honor, and anyone could come in and partake. And I hadn't had enough booing and hissing at her. I wanted to convert her to the one true faith of socialism. And so I went to the lecture, and uh, to the lunch after the lecture. And there was this long, long table, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of it, and Nathaniel Brandon, her chief lieutenant, and Alan Greenspan, who later was the head of the Fed, and uh, Leonard Peikoff, and a few other of the head group was at that table. And I was relegated to the other end of the table. There must have been maybe 100 people at, at the table, 50 on the side. And I turned to my neighbor and I said, you know, this socialism is great, capitalism is no good, and let's, you know, get it on. I was feisty in those days, still am a little bit. And what happened is he said, well, you know, I don't really know all that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I was a chutzpah neck then, and I went up and I stuck my head between Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brand. And I was your age, maybe 20, 19, 21. I was a, a senior in college. And I said, there's a socialist who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And they said, who is it? I said, it's me. And Brandon was very, very gentle and very, very nice. And he said, I'll come to the other end of the table and talk to you about this. There's no room to sit here. Uh, on two conditions. One, you uh, promise not to let the conversation lapse with this one shot, but we continue until we, we settle this. And two, you have to read two books that I'm going to recommend to you. One of them was Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, which is my favorite economics book. And the second one was Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. It's only around 1,100 pages or so. And I started reading it, and I couldn't put it down. I literally couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing in one weekend. I didn't get much sleep, but I read the whole book, except for that lecture by John Galt, which I, I just couldn't get through ever. Sort of boring. But the rest of the book is very, very uh, magnificent. It's my favorite novel, my favorite book. I recommend it to you highly, and if you haven't got one, they've got some out here for free. I would 
grab one and grab one for the person you want most to convert to free enterprise and, and rationality in economics and in politics. I've read it every 10 years since then, and each time I get more out of it. And I'm doing another five years to read it again, and I, I just uh, recommend it very highly. Let me just tell you a little story about it. Uh, the book was put out, I forget the publisher, but the publisher, I think it was Random House, had a survey of all its customers and then of all its employees as to which of the 100 best books. And in the survey of the customers, Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged, was number one. I think uh, uh, We the Living was in the top 10, and The Fountainhead was maybe uh, eight, and, and uh, Anthem 12, or something like that. The employees were mainly English majors and sociology majors, sorry to say that, but they were. And guess where her books came in in the top 100? Nowhere. Not one of her books made the top 100 of the employees, which is an indication of how the general uh, intelligentsia, the pro professoriate, uh, regard her. Not too high. They think she's a weirdo and not. Okay, so that's how I got into it. Now what I'm going to do is talk about what is libertarianism and talk about my two books. One is called Defending the Undefendable One, although when I first wrote it, I didn't call it Defending the Undefendable One, but then I wrote Defending the Undefendable Two, so I figured I had to distinguish it in some way. And uh, these, this series, of, uh, right now I'm in the middle of doing Defending the Undefendable Three. I'm sort of kicking myself that I didn't bring a copy of either of them. Because what I usually do is I read the uh, table of contents of them, but happily I'm working on defending three as we speak, and on the plane I did two chapters of it, and I always have to have the table of contents of the first two because I forget what I wrote about. I've read a lot, so I forget what I'm doing, and I'm getting absent-minded and seeing how hopefully not too soon how, but so I have the table of contents, so I'll, I'll read them off. Okay, so what is libertarianism? Libertarianism is based on maybe three axioms or three principles. The first one is the non-aggression principle. Keep your mitts to yourself. Don't grab anyone or their property without their permission. It's okay with their permission, like in boxing or sadomasochism. Well, I have to tell you my SM joke. The, uh, the masochist says to the sadist, beat me. And the sadist says, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll stick to my, my day job. <laughs> I won't try to make it as a comedian. So anyway, um, it's okay to use violence against people, either in self-defense or between consenting adults, but that's it. Otherwise, keep your mitts to yourself. Don't grab other people or their property. Well, now we have to figure out what property is. Because if I grab your coat, or rather if I grab the coat that you're now wearing, did I initiate violence against him? It all depends upon who owns the coat. If he stole that coat from me yesterday, now I'm just repossessing it. Whereas if it's his, as it happens, that's his coat, then I'm grabbing it and I'm violating the first principle of, of libertarianism. So we have to have a theory of private property rights, and we go back to John Locke, who said that the way you get property is by mixing your labor with the land, and you clear the rocks, you cut down a tree, you put in uh, some corn, and, and now you own the corn and you own the land. And then Robert Nozick, another famous libertarian, said, there's a legitimate title transfer. You clear the land and uh, get corn, I domesticate a cow, and then I own the milk and you own the corn, and then we trade. And now I own the corn even though I didn't produce it, and you own the milk even though you didn't produce that, but we can trace our ownership back to homesteading and to a legitimate title transfer, which in this case is barter. Other legitimate title transfers are buying, selling, lending, renting, and things like that. Anything voluntary. And the third principle of libertarianism is free association. No one should associate with anyone against their will. The only problem with rape is that the rape victim doesn't want to associate with the rape rapist. The only problem with slavery is that the slave doesn't want to associate with the slave master, and the slave master and the rapist compel association. So we favor free association, and nobody should force anyone to associate with anyone against his will. All the human interaction should be voluntary. So those are the three principles. 
So now I write a book, and the book that I write is predicated on the idea that there are certain actions, certain professions, certain behaviors that are compatible with libertarianism, and yet they're either prohibited or hated by everybody. And I'm defending them. I'm defending the undefendable. And the undefendable, the way I define it is, if you're doing something that is compatible with these three axioms or principles of libertarianism, and either it's illegal or it's hated by everyone, you're okay in my book and I'm gonna defend you. So now I'm gonna read the chapters of the book, and as I read them, see if, I'll read them slowly, see if um, you agree with me that these chapters are relevant. And then what I'll do is I'll talk about three or four or five of the chapters, and then that ought to take me another 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll call for questions and discussion and uh, objections or whatever, and we'll go on from there. So in defending the undefinable one, I defended the prostitute, anything between consenting adults, the pimp, the male chauvinist pig, a sexist, because the sexist doesn't initiate violence against anyone, just thinks women are inferior, or he can think anything he damn well pleases. As long as he's not violating any of those three principles, he's defensible or defendable. Second one is the, the medical, the drug pusher, and the drug addict. Again, if you put crap into your body and you're an adult, the, the philosophy is different for children. But for an adult, you should not be put in jail for using any drug that you want. In the free speech, I defend the blackmailer, and that's one I'll have to explain a little bit more. A slander or libeler, person who ruins someone's reputation, the denier of academic freedom, the advertiser, the person who yells far in a crowded theater. These are controversial issues, but I maintain that none of them violate the libertarian principle. Then there are outlaws, the gypsy cab driver. I wrote this book in 76 when there were gypsy cab drivers. The modern day equivalent would be Uber or Lyft, things like that. Uh, the, the ticket scalper and the dishonest cop. The dishonest cop I'll have to explain a little bit in more detail. Under financial, I have the non-government counterfeiter. I have the miser, the inheritor, the money lender, and the non-contributor to charity. I claim none of them violate libertarian principle, and all are either illegal or hated. Under business and trade, I have the curmudgeon, the slumlord, the ghetto merchant, the speculator, importer, middleman, and profiteer. Under ecology, environmentalism, I have the strip miner, the litterer, and the waste maker. And under labor, the fat capitalist pig employer, the scab, the rate buster, and the employee of child labor. So that's defending the undefendable one. Defending the undefendable two, and by the way, th these two books are my homage to, to um, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Uh, what they both have in common, beside the fact that he's brilliant and I'm just a pedestrian in this regard, is that we each have one the thesis or theory, and then 35 examples of it. His thesis or theory is, when you look at economics, look not only at what uh, the effect of a given policy on one person, but look on it for everybody, and also look on any economic policy like the minimum wage or tariffs or anything like that. Look upon that, analyze it, not only from the point of view of the present, but also the future. Then he has 35 examples. Well, I, ha I too have one principle and roughly 35 examples, and my principle is libertarianism. Okay, in defending the undefendable two, I have the multinational enterpriser on the trade, the smuggler, British Petroleum, they're the ones that had the uh, oil spill, nuclear energy, and the corporate raider. Under labor, I have the hatchet man, that's somebody who goes around firing people, the home worker, somebody who works at home and it's hard to unionize, the picket line crosser and attacking labor unions, the daycare provider, and the automator. Under medical, the smoker, the human organ merchant, that is people who buy and sell, use body parts like kidneys, heart, spleen, liver, blood, whatever. Uh, breast milk substitute purveyor. Under sex, I have topless in public, human um, polygamous marriage, and the burning bed. Under uh, discriminators, remember, uh, you're allowed to discriminate because if you discriminate against someone, you're not invading them, you're just refusing to deal with them. And under free association, 
you can discriminate against anyone you want. The economics of it is that this discrimination is really impotent to hurt the target of discrimination. I'll explain that uh, later. So under discriminators, I have the sexist, the peeping tom, the ageist, the homophobe, and the stereotyper. There is one uh, group that I'm against that they discriminate. That's against people that are uh, follically challenged. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to discriminate against that group. So we have an exception. I mean, I'm not a you know a rabbit or anything. I'm willing to negotiate and violate my principles. Just kidding. Uh, the homophobe and the stereotype of homophobe is somebody who hates gays, but again, doesn't initiate violence against them, which is a crucially important point. Under business, I have the wartime manufacturer, the colorizer, that's somebody who colorizes black and white movies, the baby seller, buying and selling babies, the heritage building destroyer. Under politically incorrect, I have the bad Samaritan, not the good Samaritan, the duelist, the executioner, the dwarf thrower, and the intellectual property denier. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go over maybe three or four or five of these, the ones that are the most controversial. And I've read the list. I'm not going to read it again. I hope you took notes. If there's one that you sort of jumps out at you or sticks in your craw, and you think, my god, how can you defend that? That's really indefensible or undefendable. I'll raise that during the objections or the discussion period, and I'll try to defend myself in that regard. OK, let me take the blackmail. Now, what's the blackmailer? What the blackmailer is, is, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll pick on you since you're close. Uh, I say, you know, I saw you out with uh, some lady, and I'm going to tell your wife that uh, you out with this lady unless you give me 100 bucks. That's what blackmail is. And what I say is that this should not be prohibited by law because it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle. What am I threatening him? I'm threatening him to be a gossip. Am I not? That's my threat. My sole threat against him, see, you're not supposed to initiate violence, nor are you supposed to threaten it. If I pull a gun on you and say, give me your money or I'll shoot you, even though I don't shoot you, that's a violation of the libertarian principle. But here, what I'm threatening to do is to be a gossip. Well, should gossip be against the law? No, gossip shouldn't be against the law. Gossip is what makes the world go round, what makes life interesting. All I'm threatening is to gossip. Now you have to distinguish blackmail from extortion. Extortion is I go up to him and I say, I'm going to kill your children unless you give me money. Or I'll shoot you unless you give me money. And there, the threat is to, you, is to violate the libertarian principle of non-aggression. And that would be no good. I wouldn't defend that ever. But I will defend blackmail, because blackmail doesn't violate the libertarian code, and yet blackmail is illegal. That's for sure. Now let me defend it a little bit more, not just in terms of not being against the law or not violating rights, but let me make the positive case for blackmail. Look, where is it? What's your name again? I'm sorry. No, the, the chief philosopher. Noah, sorry. I now know that Noah was two time in his wife. You're not married, so it's <laughs> not a good example, but work with me here. Where is he better off if he's in the hand of a gossip or in the hand of a blackmailer? If he's in the hand of a blackmailer like me, at least I have the decency to say, look, I'll shut up. If you give me some money, whereas if he's in the hands of a, of a gossip, that's it. He's toast. He's gone. His marriage is ruined. So he would probably prefer that a, a blackmailer got hold of this information rather than a, 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 a gossip. And if gossip should be legal, and no one says that gossip should be illegal, well then certainly blackmail should be legal because the blackmailer has more decency than the gossip. So blackmail should be legal. And I have a whole book about that. One of my 25 books is just on blackmail. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, legal theorists that disagree with me on this, and they wrote, they're trying to figure out why is it that uh, even though blackmail doesn't threaten anything that is illicit, 
it's still illegal, and they keep, up, keep coming up with many reasons why it should be illegal, and I'm saying, no, it shouldn't be illegal. It should be legal. That's the sum total of that book. Okay, another chapter, The Libeler. What's your name? Uh, Ricky. Ricky takes bats with rubber duckies. You didn't know that, but he does. And I tell everybody, and I'm now libeling him, and no one will be his friend, no one will hire him. Uh, his girlfriend breaks up with him because who wants to go with a guy who takes a bath with a rubber ducky? I mean, when you're two years old, that's okay, but you know, he's not two years old anymore. So I ruined his reputation. He'd much rather that I ruin his shoes, which are worth, I don't know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, because his reputation is worth much more to him than his shoes. Right? So how can I defend that? See, what, what the critic, what uh, the person opposite me on this view would say is that what I did is I stole his reputation. Worse than stealing your shoes, because the reputation is worth a lot more. He can get into graduate school, but once he, the rubber ducky story is out, no graduate school is going to touch him. You know, so he's really in trouble. So now the question comes, or my analysis is, does he really own his reputation? And I say paradoxically, he doesn't. Because what does his reputation consist of? Does it consist of his thoughts about himself? No. His reputation consists of our thoughts about him. Does he own our thoughts? Come on, that's silly. Of course he doesn't own our thoughts. Therefore, paradoxically, he doesn't own his reputation, even though, paradox, he works hard to promote his reputation. He benefits from having a good reputation. A lot of times the business is sold and, and the, they got a bunch of trucks and a bunch of uh, buildings and, and the whole thing is worth two million and they sell it for 10 million, why? Because of goodwill, which is reputation. Eight million is goodwill, the two million is just the uh, physical capital. So reputation is very important. Reputation is very important, but you don't own it. And therefore, if I ruin it, I haven't stolen a thing from him. Therefore, it doesn't violate the libertarian axiom of stealing or against stealing. Now we get some more paradoxes because paradoxically, his reputation will be more safe in an arena where reputations are uh, up for grabs, namely where we have full free speech, where anyone can say anything they damn well please. By the way, I'm not an absolutist on free speech. There's one free speech statement that I oppose, and that is a threat of physical violence. If I say, if you don't give me money, I'll shoot you, that is the one thing that I shouldn't say. Anything else I should be able to say, I should be able to use the F word or the, the N word or the K word, any kind of word I want, and not go to jail. Because libertarianism is solely a theory of what is the proper use of violence, what is the proper use of punitive law, and it says only to punish the axioms or the principles of violation thereof of the terms. So reputations would be safer, not more dangerous, if anyone was free to say anything they wanted. Because right now I say he takes a bath with a rubber duck. And you say, well, maybe he only takes a bath with a rubber duck every other day. Maybe there's a little exaggeration, but when there's smoke, there's fire. It must have something to do with rubber ducks. And there are worse things, you're disgusting, <laughs> worse things than taking a bath with them. He's really bad. But the point is that if anyone was free to say anything they damn well pleased, no longer would a mere allegation suffice to ruin a reputation. Now people would say, well, what's the evidence for that? I've got no evidence. I just met him. I don't know anything about him. I have no reason to believe that he does any such despicable thing. So reputation would be safer without libel laws. Now I have to tell you a little story. The New York Times interviewed me, and I must have spent three hours with them on two or three different occasions. Did anyone hear of my lawsuit with them? Just one person? Two people, okay. What happened was, Economic, yeah, the lecturing is hot work. <laughs> it's not like digging a ditch, but it's still hot work. And when I mentioned the New York Times, I'm blood boiling.